Hello, AP Calculus. Welcome to week three of new content. We continue on with unit eight. We're looking at sections 8.7 through 8.9, finding the volumes of three-dimensional figures. And right away, you might say to yourself, I know how to do that. We did that in geometry. Um, we're not talking about rectangular prisms or cylinders or pyramids or anything quite that simple. That's not calculus. What is calculus? Uh, much less regular shapes, like something like this, kind of looks like a vase turned sideways. Uh, it is the result of taking this function, 2 plus sine of x, and rotating it around the x-axis to create a three-dimensional solid. Well, what's the volume of that figure? That's the type of problem we're going to look at today, okay? We'll get to one that looks like this in the end. For now, let's take a look at something that will move us in that direction, okay? So first up, section 8.7, volumes with square cross sections. So if we take a three-dimensional figure and we slice through it, it creates uh, a two-dimensional slice that we call a cross section, okay? And in this case, we're gonna talk about taking uh, specifically three-dimensional figures where when we slice across them, the cross sections are squares, okay? So the types of problems we're gonna look at are going to tell us that the square cross sections are perpendicular to the X axis. So if we have a function that's plotted on our regular old X, Y plane, okay, uh, that is gonna give us the base area or the base of this function. And then think of the height as coming straight out towards us, okay? So what we're gonna do to find the volume is we're basically gonna take a whole bunch of slices that in theory have some thickness. We're gonna find their volumes and we're gonna add them all up, okay? But to get an exact value, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take on whatever interval we're talking about from A to B, we're gonna take an infinite number of slices whose thickness is approaching zero and we're gonna add those up. And good news is, we know how that works. Hey, the limit as the number of these that we're uh, trying to add up is approaching infinity and their thickness approaches zero, that becomes an integral. So we're gonna be able to use that. So let's look at the first type of problem. The base of a solid is the region in the first quadrant bounded by the graph, y equals two x minus x squared. So that's this curve right here, two x minus x squared uh, and the x axis. So here is our solid shaded in uh, pink or whatever color you want to call that, okay? For the solid, each cross section perpendicular to the x-axis is a square. What is the volume of the solid? So key here is each cross section is perpendicular to the x-axis. So that means that when we slice perpendicular to the x-axis, uh, the cross section is a square. That means the length and width of the cross section have to be the same. And I can call either the length or the width the y value, which means the other, like the, the dimension that's coming straight out of the screen towards us, has to be equal to the y value, okay? So what is it that we're gonna do, okay? We are going to take as many of these as possible, right, an infinite number of them on the interval zero to two, find their areas and add them up, okay? Uh, so, we just said that the, these are squares, so their length and width are equal to each other, and they're defined by the y value. Well, the y value, right, y is equal to 2x minus x squared, so that is both the length and the width. So these square areas are 2x minus x squared times 2x minus x squared. In other words, 2x minus x squared squared. And then they have some thickness, which we'll call dx, okay? And that is the integral that we're adding up. We are adding up these squares, 2x minus x squared, squared with some thickness dx on the interval from zero to two, okay? All right, well, if we're gonna actually calculate this by hand, uh, instead of trying to work with uh, undoing the chain rule here with u substitution, I'm, I'm gonna recognize that, hey, I can, I can multiply this out and then I'm just working with much easier to work with polynomial. So, 4x squared minus 4x cubed plus x squared dx, and then I integrate from there. So I know the powers on each of these x's has to increase by one, so from x squared to x cubed, from x cubed to x to the fourth, and from x to the fourth to x to the fifth, and coefficients that will cancel out 
the power rule when I go to take the derivative. So if I'm taking the derivative of x cubed, I bring the three down, but I end up with a, or with a coefficient of four, so I need a four thirds here, and so on, okay? And then, a la the fundamental theorem of calculus, I'm gonna be evaluating this from zero to two, okay? How do I evaluate from zero to two? Well, I take this and I plug two in, and then I subtract this evaluated for zero. The good news is when I evaluate for zero, that's just nothing because all of these terms have an x in them. So really, I just need to substitute two in for the x's. I'm gonna have the volume of my figure, okay? So two plugged into 4 thirds x cubed yields 32 over three. Two into x to the fourth yields 16, and two into one fifth x to the fifth yields 32 over five. All right, now to actually uh, combine these all together, I need a common denominator, common denominator, denominator of 15, so 160 over 15 minus 240 over 15 plus 96 over 15 yields us an exact volume of that figure of 16 fifteenths. All right, section 8.8, .8, volumes with cross sections that are semicircular or triangular. Okay, so how are things gonna change? Well, instead of having uh, cross-section slices where the length and width are equal to each other, where we were just able to do the 2x minus x squared squared, we're going to have to use the y value in whatever manner is appropriate for whatever shape we are working with, okay? So this first example that we'll look at is let r be the region in the first quadrant bounded by the graph y equals x squared, the line x equals 4, okay? And being in the first quadrant means we're bound by x equals zero and y equals zero. So we've got this dark green shaded area right here, okay? And it tells us r is the base of a solid whose cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are equilateral triangles, okay? So an equilateral triangle means all three sides are the same length. So think of the section that's lying flat as being the y value, and then the two other legs that come up have the same length as that. So whatever the y value is, is forming the base, and we also have y coming up here and y coming up there, okay? Now remember, we're gonna be doing the integral of all of these triangular cross sections and adding them up, which means I need the area of triangles. Area of a triangle is one half base times height. I need to know the height of this triangle, okay? All right, well, I can take this kind of diagram, drop a height down, recognize that this leg right here is one half of y, do Pythagorean theorem, and figure out that this height is whatever the y value is times root three over two, okay? So now I can set up the integral, okay? I am doing the integral from zero to four of the area of all those triangular slices, and the triangular sli slices uh, have areas of one half base times height, one half, times the base, which is y, and the height is what we just found, y times root three over two, dx, right? Remember, x, dx's are the little uh, thicknesses of our slices, okay? Well, we're doing this dx. I, I want this expression here to be in terms of x. I recognize that y is equal to x squared. So I'm just able to replace these y's with x squared. So really, we're doing the integral from zero to four of one half times x squared, times x squared times root three over two, dx. So if I just kind of multiply things together, I'm doing root three over four times x to the fourth, dx. All right, well, if I integrate that, I know the power has to increase by one. I have to account for when I pull the five down, uh, when I'm taking the derivative of this. So I would need the denominator here to be five times larger than it is in the integral, so root three over 20 times x to the fifth, and we'll be evaluating that from zero to four. Once again, when we evaluate for zero, that's just nothing. Uh, so really, I'm just evaluating this for four. So root three over 20 times four to the fifth is 1,024 root three over 20, which we can reduce to 256 root three over five, okay? All right, we said for this section that we also might work with uh, semi-circular cross sections, and in that case, we just want to make sure that we would be using whatever information is given to us correctly to find the area of the cross sections. In that case, we remember that, hey, area of a circle is pi r squared. And then we think about, hey, how much of a circle do we want? Is it a half circle? Is it a quarter circle? And divide the area of each of those circles appropriately. All right. Okay. Now on to our vase type problem from the beginning where we take a 
function and we rotate it around the x-axis, okay? Uh, we end up calling this the disk method. And let's say we take this function, y equals f of x. We're not defining exactly what f of x is yet. We're just saying, hey, it looks like this, okay? We're gonna revolve it around the x-axis so it creates something that looks like this, okay? It's not a cylinder. Our old geometry formula doesn't work. But what we can do is exactly what we did with the squares and the triangles. We can take slices, and in this case, the slices are going to be circular all the way through. It's always circles. They have different radiuses, but they're still circles. And they have, in theory, some thickness, which is why we call this the disk method, okay? Now, what is the volume of each of these disks? Well, it's the base area times the height, okay? And that little dot is in the wrong spot. There we go. So base area times the height. Well, the base is a circle, so we're doing circle area times, and the, the height is the thickness, which is our change in x. So really, we're doing pi r squared times whatever the change in x is. So the volume of the whole thing is going to be the integral from a to b of pi r squared dx. Okay, but what's the radius? Well, doesn't the radius just come from whatever the y value is? And isn't the y value f of x? Yes, yes it is. So really, we're doing the integral from a to b of pi r squared, where r is f of x. So we're doing f of x squared. Pi is going to be this common factor all the way through. Uh, instead of having to integrate with it, we can just factor it out to the front and multiply it by the end, and we'll get the same answer. It's just going to be simpler that way. OK. so. What is the volume of the solid generated when the region in the first quadrant is bounded by the graph of y equals e to the x, the x-axis, and the vertical line x equals the natural log of 2, which is right here. Okay, so we have this dark purple shaded area, and we're going to rotate that around the x-axis. So the volume is going to be equal to pi times the integral from 0 to ln of 2, times the radius, well, the radius is defined by the y value, which is f of x, which is e to the x, squared dx. Okay, well, power to a power, I can multiply the powers together, so really I'm doing pi times the integral from zero to natural log of two of e to the two x dx. All right, so let's go ahead and do the integration. Uh, e to the two x, I can look at this as u substitution. I can also kind of brain power my way through this and say that, hey, I know that uh, e to the 2x, uh, the antiderivative of that also just has to have e to the 2x in it, but if I'm taking the derivative, I would take the derivative of the inner, which is 2x, which is just 2. So I need a coefficient to cancel out that 2. So 1 half e to the 2x, and we're going to be evaluating that from 0 to the natural log of 2. Okay? All right, pi is still hanging out here as a coefficient in front. We'll worry about it at the end. So pi times I have to evaluate this for natural log of two and then subtract the same thing evaluated for zero, okay? So if I plug in natural log of two, we have to remember our log properties. So I've got a two in front of this logarithm. I can apply it as a power on the argument. So really this is ln of two squared. Well, two squared is just four. So it's e to the ln of four, okay? Well, a base to the power of the logarithm of that same base is just equal to whatever the argument is. So I'm going to end up with 4. Okay, so this right here is just 4. 4 over 2 minus uh, e to the 2 times 0. Well, anything to the 0 power is 1. So that's where the 1 half comes from. So 4 over 2 minus 1 half is 3 over 2 times pi gives us 3 pi over 2. All right. There will be a few practice problems to go along with these. We'll have a quiz at the end of the week. As always, I encourage you to show up for those Zoom office hours if you have any questions. Have a great week and talk to you soon.